What's up, baby bio penguins? It's FRQ Friday. Oh, wait, never mind. It's Sunday because, well, the stream didn't save for some reason on Friday. So we are re recording our stream um, so that any students who needed this FRQ Friday is able to still get their information. Um, and I know that I'm not two o'clock like I said I was, but I have to take my boys to the playground. So we are doing it now. So take it, leave it, but it will be saved. So don't worry if you uh, are unable to come with us today. Um, um, so our FRQ Friday we're going to do is going to be on 2013 number three, 2015 number two, um, and then we are going to uh, do a little bonus on a cladogram, I'm sorry, a phylogenetic tree that uh, somebody asked me to go over. Um, hi, Absolute Recap. Um, so let's get started. So the fossils of a low fin fish is where ancestors of amphibians are found in rocks that are at least 380 million years old. Fossils of the oldest amphibian-like vertebrate animals with true legs and lungs are found in rocks that are approximately 363 million years old. Um, three samples of rocks are available that might contain fossils of a transitional species. So the transitional species would be something that is um, between an amphibian-like vertebrate and the lobe fin fishes. So like kind of looking between those two. Um, and so they're either going to be in a rock sample that's 350 million years old, one that's 370 million years old, and one that's 390 million years old. So we need to select the most appropriate sample um, of the rocks in which to search for that transitional species between the low fin fishes and the amphibians. Okay, so let's think for a second. Our low fin fishes were 380 million years ago, right? And then our amphibian-like vertebrate would be 363 million years old, right? So I need to find something that's between these two ages, right? So 390 would be too long ago, right? Because that's before the 380, right? And then the 350 is too short because it's before, like, after the 363 million years old, right? So I have to find something that's between. So the one I would pick would be 370, and it tells us just to justify, right? So the justification would be that it's between the 380 for the low fin fishes and the 363 from our amphibian like, right? And I've told you this every single week, right? If you don't know something, just guess, right? What's the worst that could happen if you have no clue? and you guess the number, right? I have three choices, 350, 370, 390. Keg you have a one third chance of getting it right. You get it wrong, eh, whatever. You get it right, yes, I got a point. Okay, so make sure that you at least try. The worst thing you can do is leave something blank. So always, 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 always try. I think it's like a Michael Jordan quote that says you'll miss 100% of the shots that you don't take, okay? So you need to at least try right? Um, so let's just show the rubric for that. It said um, the selection would be the rocks is 370 million years old. Um, the justification is transitional species would be found between 380 where the lobe fin finches were and 363 where the amphibians were, right? Um, and remember anything that's in parentheses is talking about that those are optional things you could have written. So the second part of this question says to describe two pieces of evidence that's provided by fossils of the transitional species that would support a hypothesis that amphibians evolved from low fin fishes. So I'm looking for something that is going to be in all three organisms. You have to think to yourself, okay, what can I use to prove that organisms are related to one another? So this entire week when we've been doing our daily uh, review in the um, stories, we've been looking at these phylogenetic trees and these cladograms. And the data that comes from those is usually looking at a chart, right? And in that chart, it shows the number of differences in amino acids. So molecular data would be a great resource that you could use to say, okay, these are related or these are not related, right? Um, so you could use DNA, you could use proteins, you looking at the amino acid differences, nucleotide differences, all of that would be good resources, right? You can look at homologous structures. Homologous structures are structures that are similar due to a common ancestry, right? So because of the fact that they share a common ancestor, they have the exact same bone structure, right? Now, the, uh, the bones may look slightly different because of adaptations that might have taken place, but the overall structure is the same. Kind of think of it like a bat wing and a cat arm and a human arm, right? They all have the exact same structures of a humerus, a radius, an ulna, and then the phalanges, right? And it's kind of weird to think about that the wing is actually like an arm for a bat, right? It's kind of cool. Um, but be very careful that you don't um, give other words. Like analogous structure would not be okay, right? Because analogous structure is due to convergent evolution. So you have to be very careful about the stuff that you choose. Um, so the different things that we could have had on our rubric, um, you could have said, 
um, bone. So giving me a specific one, talking about the legs, limbs, digits, talking about the vertebrate, talking about flat shell, uh, skulls, talking about ribs, talking about flexible neck, basically giving me any type of bone would have been appropriate here. Talking about the, the scales, the teeth, any other homologous structure, those are all good. Um, talking about any trait that was found in them. Oh, I forgot to mention this one. If they are found in the same area, that also could have shown that they were common ancestors. That's something called biogeography, um, in which you use geography and you see the different locations of organisms, and that kind of helps you to um, determine common ancestry. And then the last thing we had was the molecular DNA, right? So now notice it said to describe. I find that a lot of times when you have a describe question, students will just name drop homologous structures and DNA. Boom, and then you move on. That's not just a distress there. That's not a describing. That is an identifying. So you need to be very, very careful that when they say describe, that you're actually giving a little bit more than just identify. So you would talk about the homologous structure and you would talk about how that homologous structure would be similar between these three organisms. You would talk about the DNA and how that DNA is similar between all of the three things, right? So whenever you have a describe, it could be to describe how or describe why. And you always want to give one of those two. Um, and so there's another teacher that I work with who always says it's a, um, like it's one to two sentences is a describe statement. Um, so that is the end of 2013, number three. Um, and so if you were in my Marco Learning, I think it was the AP hack one, the very first AP hack I did on unit three. I already went over the second FRQ that we're going to do today, um, which is on, um, it's actually cell respiration, um, but there's a component of it that has to do with evolution, which is why it was put into our evolution FRQ Friday. Um, so it's a little flash from the past, but hey, it'll be good. Um, ooh, I went past the question. Uh, so... Um, here we see they've given us the parts and the steps of glycolysis and pyruvate oxidation. They've given us the Krebs cycle and they've given us the electron transport chain. Okay. So they've given us this diagram. So students always look at me, they go, oh my God, there's 10 steps of glycolysis and eight steps of the Krebs cycle. I don't know how to memorize all those. You don't have to. Okay. Just remember what goes in to the cell respiration, what comes out of cell respiration, what goes into each of these stages, what comes out, where do they take place, and why are they important? That is the big thing that you're supposed to be getting out of this, okay? So you're not going to have to know all 10 steps. You don't have to know every single enzyme, every single part. Now, maybe when you get to college, you might, because I had to learn them all. But at this point in AP Bio, you don't need to do all that, okay? Um, so it says the cell respiration, and close the metab metabolic pathways of glycolysis, Krebs cycle, and electron transport chain as represented in the figures. In cellular respiration, carbohydrates and other metabolites are oxidized, and the resulting energy transfer reactions support the synthesis of ATP. So using that information, describe one contribution of each of the following ATP synthesis. So I'm using this diagram to help me to say, okay, well, how is ATP made? Like, where does ATP come from, right? So it says the catabolism of glucose and glycolysis and pyruvic oxidation. So I see that here is my glucose, and I'm going to go through a cat catabolic reaction, which just means I'm going to break apart the glucose. So the glucose gets broken apart into pyruvate and then continues to be broken apart into acetyl-CoA. And I can see all that in my diagram. So how do I make ATP? Um, there's ATP right there. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. There's ATP right there. So now... How do you get ATP in the process of glycolysis? So think to yourself, say, okay, ATP is made, what's going on? And this is where we do need to put a little bit of biology knowledge, right? So the ATP that's made here is by something called substrate level phosphorylation, right? So at the substrate level, there's some type of something, a substrate, that binds to your enzyme, and that substrate has a phosphate on it. So the enzyme is going to allow you to take the phosphate off of that substrate and bind it to ADP to make ATP. So that's called substrate level phosphorylation. So that's one way we could have done it. Also looking at our diagram, I see there are these, this thing called acetyl-CoA. And if I continue looking at the second diagram, I see the acetyl-CoA goes into the Krebs cycle. So right there, I can use my picture to say, oh, look. This is in the next step. So acetyl-CoA, by breaking down the glucose, I can make acetyl-CoA, which goes into the Krebs cycle. And the last thing you see is, look, we make something called NADH. Hmm, NADH, where am I going to see that? Oh, look, NADH is right here. It's dropping off something, which allows these protons to move across the gradient. So you could talk about how um, that NADH is going to allow for the transfer of something. 
Now, this again requires a little bit of biology, right? So um, I've always told my students that that H stands for holding. I know that's a lie, but it's the, the lie that I tell them to try to help them to remember things, right? So the H stands for holding. So if you see that you have NADH, it means you're holding an electron. And that electron can then be brought to electron transport chain to fuel the process of making that uh, proton pump, right? Um, and so those are the three things we could have done. And those are the three different options you could have given for this question. Um, so here you see we could have said produces the NADH for electron transport chain, produces the acetyl-CoA for the Krebs cycle, and then it produces energy by phosphorylation of ADP, okay? Two of those three you got just by looking at a picture, okay? So you could have given two different of these answers without ever knowing any type of biology, which is, as I told you before, the questions will oftentimes give you answers, right? They're not gonna give you all the answers, but there will be some answers embedded in the picture. So make sure that you at least try. Um, so the second part of this, we have to do the oxidation of the intermediates of the Krebs cycle. So as a reminder, oxidation means loss of electrons. Um, so as I oxidize the acetyl-CoA, I'm going to lose those electrons. So as we said before, NADH is going to hold those electrons, right? And as we talked about before, NADH is going to then take those electrons to the electron transport chain, um, which can then make that proton pump. I also see that GTP is made. Well, GTP is similar to ATP, right? ATP has an adenine in it, and GTP has a guanine. So it's basically the same thing. So I can use the GTP to make ATP. Um, and so you can talk about the phosphorylation of ADP using GTP. Um, and then you also see that I make these things called FADH2. And FATH2 is going to be similar to NADH, in which it's going to also hold those electrons to bring them to the electron transport chain. So the different options, as we already said, NADH, FADH2. Um, you also could have said releasing high energy electrons. You could have said producing the energy that we need to pump those protons. And then last, you could have said GTP um, to ADP, right? Which is all the stuff we just mentioned a second ago. And the last part, how do I use the formation of a proton gradient by electron transport chain? Okay, so um, those of you who are not sure and don't know, the last step of cellular respiration is called oxidative phosphorylation. But then oxidative phosphorylation, there's two steps. You have electron transport chain and you have chemiosmosis. The electron transport chain alone does not make ATP. The electron transport chain is exactly what I said. It is a way to transport electrons. It's a chain of molecules that will transfer that electron down. As it drops in energy, it pumps a proton across the gradient, right? Um, across the membrane. And so all that we're looking at here is that we're using that energy that's released to fuel another reaction, okay? And that reaction that we're fueling is the pumping of a proton against its gradient. And so we'll see a large number of protons in our um, inner membrane space, okay? Hi, Elizabeth. Um, it'll pump it into that inner membrane space. And so um, how, by me having this high concentration of protons in the IM space, how does that allow me to make ATP? And that comes down to that chemiosmosis step. Now, this does require a little bit of bi biology knowledge to get this point. So you would have to know that there's an enzyme that's in that membrane called ATP synthase. Enzymes tell you what they do. So ATP synthase is going to synthesize ATP. I think we figured that out, right? Um, and so what it's going to do is it's going to allow that proton gradient. The proton flows down ATP synthase, which then is going to rotate it, which allows for the energy that's needed for ATP synthesis. So let's see what they had on the rubric. Um, so flowing the protons through a membrane-bound ATP synthase generates ATP and it provides energy for phosphorylation. So you could just mention that this um, gradient is what's going to allow for the um, production of that energy for phosphorylation. So continuing on for the next part, this is where evolution comes into play. So use each of the following observations to justify the claim that glycolysis first occurred in a common ancestor. So these are our three different claims. Okay. So on the AP exam, they're going to give you a claim. They're going to say, a researcher said, a scientist said, and you have to justify it. You have to use your biology knowledge to then say, well, this is why they're right or this is why they're wrong. Okay. And so I need to justify the claim that glycolysis occurred in a common ancestor using these facts, okay? So the first fact I need to use is that all organisms perform glycolysis, 
Okay, well, that's a true statement. All organisms do perform glycolysis. Why do all organisms perform glycolysis? Well, if we think for a second, we have to think evolution, right? Common ancestor. Well, this must have evolved in the common ancestor, and it must have been passed down from generation to generation, right? It must have allowed for these organisms that were able to go through glycolysis to be more favorable. If the organism is more favorable, it's more likely to survive. If it's more likely to survive, it's more likely to pass on its trait, and it's more likely to produce more offspring. It all comes back to natural selection, right? And that's what you had to bring into play here. You had to talk about that um, this trait must have been passed down, originated early, it's inherited, passed down, it's highly conserved. You had to talk about there was a selective advantage. And you only had to give one of these bullets. Oftentimes when you'll see bullets, it just means these are the different options you could have said. You could have said any of these, but these were the two different things you could have said. Okay. So the second part, glycolysis occurs under anaerobic conditions. So why would we say that it occurred in a common ancestor knowing that it is under anaerobic conditions, which is true, right? Glycolysis doesn't need any type of oxygen in order to undergo its process. So why? Well, let's think. If it was a common ancestor, it must have occurred before oxygen was present, right? And so that tells us that it predates atmospheric oxygen. It predates this process that produced the oxygen in the air, Okay, um, and so that would be your justification point there. Um, I did press button, sorry, y'all. Um, it or origins predates the pre atmospheric oxygen or it predates photosynthesis because remember, photosynthesis is how we're able to make that oxygen. So, the last part we have glycolysis occurs only in the cytosol. Well, why are we saying that it must have been a common ancestor if it occurs only in the cytosol? Well, it must have occurred before we ever had any type of membrane-bound organelles or our prokaryotes wouldn't be able to also undergo this process, right? If it occurred after we made membrane-bound organelles, then it would be something that would be only in our eukaryotes. So because of the fact that it predates our membrane-bound organelles, which is basically eukaryotes, this can also show us how it must have been in a common ancestor. Um, and so those were the uh, things you had to say there. So origin of glycolysis predates the cells with membrane-bound organelles, predates prokaryotes, or predates that process of endosymbiosis, which was how we were able to make the membrane-bound organelles. Um, and remember, if you have questions, you're more than welcome to put them down the, the chat box. I can see the chat box as I'm talking. Um, unlike when we do the Q&As, we're so kind of involved that we sometimes don't see the chat and it moves so fast. Um, so the last question is a math question. So earlier this week on my live, oh, I'm sorry, on my stories, I mentioned that there's sometimes unique math. So it may not be math that your teacher has gone over with you, but it's still important math. Um, and it's stuff that you can logically think through. Um, and so it's not something that would be on your formula sheet. Okay, and that's why I called it unique math, because you're not prepared to do it, but you have the content knowledge to be able to do it. Okay, I believe in you. Remember, you're a penguin. So, a researcher estimates that a certain organism, the complete oxidation of glucose, provides 30 molecules of ATP for each molecule of glucose. So, in every molecule of glucose, I can make 30 molecules of ATP. The energy released from the total oxidation of glucose under standard conditions is 686 kilocals per mole. So that means that in a lab, when I break down glucose, I should get 686 kilocals per mole or, or one mole of glucose. The energy released from the hydrolysis of ATP to ADP to inorganic phosphate under standard conditions is 7.3 kilocals per mole. Calculate the amount of energy available from the hydrolysis of 30 moles of ATP. So I know that I have 30 moles of ATP, and one mole of ATP gives me 7.3 kilocals. All I have to do is multiply them. So 30 moles produced times the 7.3 kilocals per mole gives me 219 kilocals. Yes, units are required. We don't believe in naked numbers. You must have the unit. Any student who did not give a unit did not get credit for this question. So you must get that unit. So the second question says, calculate the efficiency of the total ATP production from one mole of glucose, okay? So what this wants to know is how efficient was it, right? So I know that I made 219 kilocals from my 30 molecules of ATP, but the real question is, how good was that system, right? I should have had 686, so how efficient was my energy transfer? And so all I have to do is divide them. So I take the 219 
divided by the 800, 686, which will give me 0.319. So my system is 31% or 32%. Okay. Um, now, notice I put an or here. That means based on your rounding, you would have given one of those two answers um, according to the scoring guidelines. Okay. You cannot give both answers. Okay. Um, by you giving an answer and saying or in it, you show that you don't actually know what you're doing. So always be very sure of one answer. Okay. Give them the one answer you're coming up with. If you're saying that the answer is 31, go with it. 31%. You think it's 32? Give it 32%. If you just say 31 or 32, that doesn't tell you much because you're just guessing at it. Or you say um, it could increase or it could have no effect. You don't know the answer, so you're just guessing. So we can't take that. You have to give me one answer. Don't give me wishy-washy, vague answers. You got to give me one, okay? Um, so the last question is, describe what happens to the excess energy that's released from the metabolism of glucose. So we see that the system's only 31 to 32% efficient, right? So where does the extra energy go, right? Where's the other 69 to 68% of the energy? Where is that energy at? So think for a second. Why are warm-blooded organisms warm? Why is your car hot when you turn it off? Why is the back of your um, refrigerator hot? And the reason why that extra energy is produced as heat, right? The reason why an organism, an endotherm, is going to go through more cellular respiration at colder temperatures is because it has to keep its body warm. So it goes through more cellular respiration to produce that heat. And that heat allows for the um, organisms to stay nice and warm. So the extra energy that's released is released as heat. And then this last question um, is not actually a fair game question anymore. Um, they used to have you posing scientific questions. That has not really been on the new curriculum. I haven't seen that anywhere. Um, so, and this is a very hard question for me to grade. So I don't want to put you down the wrong path. So I'm not going to give you too much information here. Um, but the question was the enzymes of Krebs cycle function in the cytosol bacteria among eukaryotes, the enzymes function mostly in the mitochondria. Propose a scientific question that connects the location of the enzyme of the Krebs cycle to eukaryotes. Okay. So they want you to come up with a question to say, well, how does the mitochondria relate to a prokaryote? That's literally all you have to come up with. So thinking about the mitochondria is where the Krebs cycle takes place and the electron transport chain takes place. Um, and specifically, it's talking about the Krebs cycle in the question. So you want to connect the Krebs cycle of the mitochondria to a prokaryote. Um, and so your question would have just been any valid question. Um, so an example would be, since the Krebs cycle occurs in the cytoplasm of the mitochondria, does it suggest the mitochondria were once prokaryotes? Now, again, I don't know what types of Scientific questions were accepted on this. I was not the reader on this question, so I'm sorry. I can't give you too much information on that. Um, but this isn't really a fair game question anymore. Um, there is something down in the question box. Is it possible to get a screenshot of this question after the live? Um, all of this entire PowerPoint is already posted onto my website. Um, so if you go to um, appbiopenguins.weebly.com um, and you go under the 2020-2021 AP review, there's a drop down. Um, and then it'll say eight, I'm sorry, it says uh, FRQ Fridays. Going there, you will get a copy of the video as well as on the very bottom of it, you will see um, the entire PowerPoint exported as a PDF with everything already underlined and everything like that. Um, so I have already provided it to you. I know it's kind of hard to see it when it's on my phone and I'm screaming it, like streaming it like it is. I, it's, I don't know. If you have a better idea of how to do this, I'm more than welcome to take them. Um, so you're welcome, sweetheart. Uh, so uh, the last question, remember I said that um, somebody asked me to do something. So this is a bonus 2014 number two. Um, and so earlier this week, I gave you this character table. Okay. Um, and they said, well, how do I take a character table and know how to fill in this tree? Well, FYI, you're never going to have to draw this on your own. A cladogram in a phylogenetic tree will always be given to you. Okay. Um, you'll just have to fill it in. So remember how I sometimes will show you how can you do it without knowing anything, right? So how can I use this table? And I know nothing. I'm completely clueless. I know no biology. I'm like, oh my God, what? How can I use this chart to come up with an answer and get points, right? So if I look at the chart, I see there's going to be three things that are closely related and two things that are closely related. How do I know that? Because they're branched together, okay? So what three things look the same and what two things look the same? If I look at here, I see the cow, the horse, and the pig 
all have straight pluses going down. So there's three things that are similar to each other. Oh my God, look. There's three things that are similar to each other. So you can put the cow, the horse, and the pig together. Their order does not matter. I have a node here, which means that anything is rotatable. You could have put horse, cow, pig. You could have put pig, cor, uh, pig, cow, horse. You could have put pig, horse, cow. It doesn't really matter. As long as those three organisms are on these three lines, you're perfectly fine. And then, as we said before, the things that look the same, the cat and the human are looking the same. So, of course, we have two down here. Go ahead and put those down there. And again, those can rotate where I can have human at the top and cat at the bottom. It really doesn't matter. So now this is where I need to bring a little bit of biology in, right? So once I put those, how can I fill it in to put the traits? Because you have to fill the traits in on your tree, right? So I like to think about pathogenic trees and cladograms like you're driving down a road. As you drive down the road, you pick up different characteristics or you can drop off characteristics, right? Um, so you can also think of it like Monopoly, like you pass by that Go and you pick up your $200, right? So everything after Go has $200, but everything before Go does not have $200. I hope you get the logic. Um, and so when we look at our character table, we can look and see, okay, where, which organisms have the characters? And then when did they possibly pick them up? So looking at our character table, I can see that all of my organisms have lactose and all of them have protein A, uh, a right? So you see the plus going across this way, which means that every single organism has lactose and protein A. So I can go ahead and put those onto my tree, right? So lactose and protein A is going to be with all of the organisms, right? So we can see that every single organism, no matter if it diverged here and went up or diverged here and went down, it has those characteristics, right? And so we see that the cow, the horse, and the cow went up, right? Now, those ones have also a protein B and a casein, right? But the cat and the human that went down do not have that. So, what I can do is I can actually put those on this road up here, right? As we come up, we pick up protein A and we pick up casein, right? Which is these three organisms have it, but these ones do not. I drove down the road, I picked up lactose, protein A, and then these organisms picked up protein B and casein. These ones came down the road, had lactose and protein A, and then they continued going on their path. So that's one way you could have done it. The other way you could have done it is saying, okay, well, all of them had all of the characteristics, but when they diverged, these organisms lost that characteristic. And that's why you saw the negative there was because they lost that characteristic. So um, next Friday, we will do another FRQ Friday over 2018 number three, 2018 number seven, 2016 number five. Um, and who knows what time it's going to be because, you know, I change it every single week on us. But it's okay because I still make them all recorded and we're perfectly fine pending that they actually record this time. If it doesn't record after round two, you're just not going to have a video this time. Um, and then here's your reminder to go ahead and make sure you download the 2021 um, AP exam app. Remember, you have to have that for the digital exam, as well as you also probably want to go ahead and download that just so you can take a look at the practice questions that they have embedded for you. And that is all. So remember, you're AP Bio Penguins and you're dressed for success. Bye, y'all.